Hi guys, uh, welcome back to part two of Vinit and I's exploration of uh, the bi community throughout history um, and separatism. Uh, as you might have noticed, Vinit is in a different location to the previous videos and to this video that we're introducing. Um, Vinit, do you want to explain? <laughs> Yeah, so I moved house at the end of Feb. I moved out of my parents' place. Yes, I know I'm old and have just moved out. Um, I moved in with my boyfriend. So Yay. welcome to my new place. You're new filming. You've got some lovely buy books behind you. Yeah, yeah. I need to get more, but, you know, that's a, that's a whole other issue that we'll get into in the next video. And for today's video, we're going to go back in time a little bit. Um back to when we filmed in February because our discussion about bi history was so long it was like over an hour uh Vinit and I have a lot to say on this topic yeah we're gonna show you the rest of that the second half of that discussion I think we got up to like 70s and 80s and now we're going to be talking a bit more about like modern day bi movements and the history there so if we look different if Vinit's background looks different that's just the magic of YouTube so hope you enjoy this video Hope you enjoy. <laughs> in the 90s, we got a lot of groups rising up, right? We got a lot of really important things happening because, correct me if I'm wrong, but the 90s was when we got Bi Visibility Day. The 90s is where we got Bisexual Index. And really, sort of late 80s and the early 90s is where sort of Binet USA were doing a lot of great stuff. Um, we won't talk about their current stuff, but they didn't do they a lot are. of good... when they did good stuff. <laughs> when they did good stuff. Um, so a lot of really important stuff was happening there. The bisexual uh, revolution was really taking, going forward. Um, and a lot of groups started springing up and doing really important work. Three of my favourite, not favourite, but three things that I think were very important to buy history happened in the 90s. Um, one is that in 1993, I think, um, the Lesbian and Gay Centre in London banned bisexuals from their events um, because they said that bi men were like a danger to lesbians and gay men because, you know, and then they said that bi women were, I don't know, probably a danger somehow. <laughs> um, so they, they banned bisexuals from using the venue and like we've just discussed, there are no, there were no physical venues. Um, but interestingly, the Quaker Centre in Kingston stepped in and said that the bisexuals could hold Bifest in Kingston, which is where it's still held today. I think it may have changed from, it wasn't called Bifest back then, but it was kind of a similar thing. Um, so that's really interesting. That's like a very solid thing you can point to and be like, it's not that bi people weren't there and weren't trying to be involved, it's that they were blocked. Like, yeah. they were physically not allowed to host events there. Yeah. <laughs> and then another favorite is in 1995, Newsweek published an article called Bisexuality, a new sexuality emerges. <laughs> with this really weird cover of like two men and a woman and a woman in business suits. Yeah. Like yeah. looking really dramatic. I think that's so funny. And it's just kind of talking about like, ooh, guys, look at this weird new thing that's cropped up when it had been, you know, going on for forever before then. Yeah. Um and I think I think that's where a lot of the idea behind bisexuality being new, even though that was that was decades ago now, which is kind of scary because it reminds you how old I am. That was like 30 plus years ago, um, going back to sort of 80s and 90s. And um, it's, it's interesting because of, back then it was still being called new and even today it's still being called new. We haven't moved past that, but it wasn't new then, it isn't new now. Um, but it sparked a lot of stuff like, for example, uh, we, were, we were obviously moving forward and we were making our own community, but it caused a lot of backlash. The LG, the lesbian and gay centers were banning us. They were having conversations like we talked about with Mel in their own centers going, bisexuality, let's discuss this new fad, you know? Um, and it came, it started coming up a lot. There was a lot of backlash. And 
a lot of the stuff that happened to bi people can be seen as recycled homophobia. And mm -hmm. it's similar today with trans people. A lot of the things that happen to trans people is recycled homophobia. But yet we, our own community can't even identify that because the lesbian and gay people are part of the backlash. And even today, lesbian and gay, probably some bisexual people too, are part of the backlash towards trans people. Yeah, and we don't um, realize that it's the same thing that happened to us. Yeah, like another time you can see that reflection is that like, I can't remember the exact date of it, but it was a Michigan dyke march um, that was gonna be inclusive of like bisexuals and trans people explicitly for the first time. Like obviously we'd always been a part of it, but they were putting us on the ballot, so to speak. <laughs> and there's this huge argument and some people protested it. Like uh, a lot of lesbian sectors protested it and it kind of didn't go ahead and it was a big mess. And then in 2017, lesbians protested London Pride. It's still happening. <laughs> and it, it kind of shows the importance of LGBTQ plus history and LGBTQ plus history month to teach that history. Because if we don't learn that history, we're never going to do right the next time round. We're never going to learn from our mistakes. We're just mm -hmm. going to repeat them. Um, and that's why like a lot of this history should be taught in schools, it should be compulsory. You know, we should be giving out these manuals when people go to Pride, be like, welcome to Pride, your first Pride, we make did. this history manual, <laughs> please, for the love of God, learn what we found. <laughs> because then we won't have the same people coming into our community, learning new stuff and being involved in the backlash for it. Yeah, because I mean, teen something very interesting I've said interesting a lot this episode I'm so sorry something I read once and I can't remember why I read it annoyingly but it kind of said um that when you're part of like a, another minority say an ethnic minority or a religious minority often and in most cases you're raised by people from that culture and so you learn that culture you learn that history and kind of your struggle and the struggle of that minority is part of your identity. But when you're queer, you're often not raised by queer people. And obviously now it's becoming more common that you are. <laughs> and so when you come out, you have been completely separated from that culture and from that history. And so you are becoming part of a minority without fully understanding often why you're a minority. Yeah. And so people come out and, you know, there's there's not been parents or anyone to teach them history. And we lost an entire generation of queer people who yeah. could have been teaching us this history. And I think that's why we still have like so many of the same fucking discourses over and over again. <laughs> What's interesting as well is that a lot of people, I saw this great tweet earlier, and a lot of people like to blame the idea that we lost a generation as to why we don't know certain things. And it's like, it's important to realize that while we did lose a generation and that does mean that it's, the history is less visible because the people aren't around. There are still a lot of elder queers. Like, and when we say elder queers, we don't mean 30 because a lot of people think 30 <laughs> means you're dead. We mean there are people in their mid, mid age, like 40s and 50s. We mean a lot of people who are 60 and 70. There are a lot of elder queers out there, including by elder queers that we should all be learning from. And it's so important that, you know, if you enter actual queer spaces and even online, you will find these people, you will find them. Yeah. It's just a matter of actually listening to them. Yeah, just because they're saying something you don't like doesn't mean you get to ignore that part of history. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, we get people ignoring us and we're like nearly their age and it makes me feel mm -hmm. so old. It's like, let me just talk to the 16 year old and tell them they're wrong. <laughs> like... Yeah, I've kind of implemented an 18 plus policy in that like, if mm -hmm. I can if I can see that you're under 18, I'm not discoursing with you. You will grow out of this phase. <laughs> yeah. You fucking hope so anyway. Yeah. <laughs> like there is enough out there that 
if you're online starting shit, you can be online reading shit. Um, we should make t-shirts of that. <laughs> and bikes it as t-shirts. Oh God. But also when we talk about that history, another thing that we should probably talk about is section 28. Because a lot of the time we talk about section 28 and how it affected gay people, but we don't talk about how it affected bi people. Because if we think about bisexuality not really being that visible and only really starting to gain traction, and then you have lesbian and gay people excluding us, and then you have the, the fact that you can't even talk about this stuff because so many people, like, obviously the idea was that you can't teach it and you can't indoctrinate people by teaching it. But I mean, a lot of people were just scared to talk about it full stop, which meant that something that was only just starting was suddenly completely stalled. And that caused such an impact. Mm -hmm. That kind of is the story of like the early bi community that just as we were starting to like, you know, sprout up from the ground, the HIV crisis happens and section 28 happens. And so this little baby movement just gets like cut, you know? Yeah, and, and we're still really recovering from it. From it. Yeah, we're still just recovering from that, really. Like um, I was in primary school when section 28 was repealed. Yeah. And I'm a baby, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I turn 26 next month, like, <laughs> but I was still at school, it was like, it was still around. Yeah, I had entered high school when it was repealed in England, it repealed in Scotland earlier, but yeah, when it was repealed in England, I was just entering high school, and like, that was 2003, right, and you'd think, okay, it's repealed, that didn't mean it was taught. Mm -hmm. I didn't get any education throughout the whole of high school, and I don't think you did either. Um, we did, but we had a gay PSHE teacher, whatever that, that was. <laughs> you know, he showed us this video called Fit. Oh my God, if you remember Fit, comment below, because it was wild. <laughs> but also, Fit only mentioned gay men and lesbians. <laughs> there was no one else. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's the problem as well, is that when we did get education on LGBTQ+, it kind of went, LG... Yeah. That's how it went. It didn't say LGBTQ+, it said LG. <coughs> mm -hmm. Silence. Um, and I think that's really important as well, because you can say that, yeah, it was appealed and then things were taught, but like, were things taught? Or was it just lesbian and gay? Mm -hmm. Did ace people and trans people and bi people get support? Not necessarily. Um, yeah, I didn't get any LGBTQ plus education um, as far as I can remember. Um, nothing explicit anyway. It's only mentioned in passing and that was about it. Um, and it's only really now that we actually have, you know, and that's the thing is that even though it was appealed, it was kind of, well, you could teach it, but a lot of people were probably scared because of that previous law. And maybe some people did, but it was only until, I think it's this, this academic year, so from 2020, September, was it actually enforced in law in the UK wow. to teach that, to actually teach LGBTQ plus stuff. And in the US, it's still not. There's still states there that are teaching negative LGBTQ plus stuff. Like it's mandated that it has to be negative stuff, mm -hmm. um, which is completely wild. Um, and I think this brings us back to sort of assimilation is that a lot of people are fighting towards being assimilated. And a lot of people think that when we got equal marriage, all the problems were solved. But we're so far from our problems being solved. There are still so many battles that we are still not winning yet, that we've still yeah. not won. Um, and one of them is, is more safe spaces, especially for people like bi people and trans people and ace people that are specific for us. There's a lot of, there's a lot of fights to be had on the trans, trans front, like so many, so many fights. Let's not even talk about gender recognition clinics and people waiting 36 months. Let's not talk about that because it's completely unhinged. Yeah, and you're right. There's so many fights left. And I think a lot of people, and 
especially young people, I feel so old when I say that, when I'm like, the young people today. But yeah, it's kind of like, okay, you can see queer people on TV now, which is cool, and you can get married and you can't legally be discriminated against, although fuck knows what's gonna happen after Brexit. We're <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, talking about scrapping the human rights bill. But um, that doesn't mean that everything's fixed. Like, there are so many fights. 75% of bi women have experienced sexual violence. What the fuck are we doing about that? Nothing. Right, right. exactly. A huge population of trans people are homeless. What's happening about that? There are so many fucking fights left to still have. And we're still arguing about these things that we've been arguing about throughout all of our history, just going in circles, yeah. fighting about the same shit. Like fighting about stuff like slurs as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like such a non-fight. Like this is what people are choosing to fight about. Like, please go touch the grass, please <laughs> go feel the outside. Like I know it's a pandemic, but please, for the love of God, just like open a window, do something. Because like, it's not helpful. It's not healthy. It's not useful. There are so many things that are happening to us. There are so many people who are living at home in a toxic environment and can't leave because of a pandemic. And you're choosing to discuss whether we can say the DNF slur. Yeah. That is what you are choosing to discuss. Like, it's not important and we need to move past this and yeah. instead of going around in circles. And I think the only way we do is if we actually learn what came before. And that mm -hmm. is why LGBTQ plus history is so important. important. So thank you very much for watching the second part of our by communities with history i hope you enjoyed it we'll be back next month with a brand new video we've already recorded so we can give you a sneak peek and it's all about books so look forward to that i'm so excited for next month's video um i've never seen so many buy books in one place and i know you guys are gonna love the discussion that we had so thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next month see you next month bye